I'm Caroline. I'm Peyton. I'm Alexia. And I'm Marilyn. Cryptobranchus alleghenius alleghenius, otherwise known as the Eastern Hellbender, was named for their eerie devilish appearance, but partially named for its unusually large size. Mature hellbenders can weigh up to 5 pounds and range in length from 12 to 29 inches, making it the largest amphibian species in North America. They achieve this unusually large size through their carnivorous diet and long lifespan. Hellbenders will reach sexual maturity at age 5, but can live up to 25 years old. Hellbenders require very specific habitat. According to the National Wildlife Foundation, hellbenders typically live under large rocks or boulders that are partially buried in cold, fast-flowing streams. These rocks provide protection from predators, and hellbenders may abandon a habitat if the rocks are removed or disturbed. In regards to water quality, hellbenders prefer fast-flowing fresh water with a pH between 7.6 and 9, temperatures between 9.8 and 22.5 degrees Celsius. Dissolved oxygen levels should be between 8.4 and 13.6 parts per million, and ideally low conductivity. Basically, hellbenders like very undisturbed freshwater habitat with all of these features present. Here's a figure highlighting the important morphological features present in hellbenders aiding to life under fast, cold freshwater streams. These features include the presence of four legs, a paddle-shaped tail, and being flattened dorsoventrally. These three adaptations allow them to walk along stream beds without being pushed around by water currents. Additionally, hellbenders have very wrinkled bodies. With this molted brown, fleshy, loose skin, the hellbender has the ability of breathing directly through its pores, hence why hellbenders are highly sensitive to changes in its surrounding environment and prefer fast-flowing water. Hellbenders are limited to the eastern United States. They can also be found in New York, Georgia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia, Virginia, Kentucky, Illinois, Indiana, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Mississippi, Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas. There are four main conservation and ethical issues that could potentially arise with our management plan. First, is the management plan beneficial or detrimental to the stability of the local ecosystem? Second, the introduction of captive bred individuals into a wild setting due to the differences in the conditions they were raised in, as well as differing microbial communities of captive bred versus wild hellbenders. Third, introducing species into an ecosystem that adapted without its presence can hinder the ecosystem or the hellbender itself. And lastly, the potential risks that are associated with handling and tagging, such as the transfer of diseases or improper placement of tags. Additionally, implications of conservation concerning the ecosystem include both positive and negative aspects. Positive aspects include how hellbenders stabilize invasive and native species populations and their indicators of clean water. However, one negative implication of conservation would be that hellbenders require specific habitat features in order to have a healthy population. If prime habitats for the species do not include aspects like large flat rocks in the rivers and the presence of forests along riparian zones, they may need to alter the ecosystem. While these are good aspects to an ecosystem, it can be difficult to manage and ensure these features are present in a given area. Besides conservation implications on the ecosystem, there are also implications on species. Hellbenders are prey items which benefits other species while also having a limiting factor on their population growth. They also can be the source of diseases, particularly chytrid fungus. Chytrid fungus affects amphibians worldwide and adding another amphibian into the ecosystem can cause the fungus to spread easily amongst amphibian species. The first picture on the left shows various degrees of lesions observed in Ozark hellbenders primarily due to chytrid fungus, and the picture on the right shows a hellbender with chytrid fungus due to excessive shedding on the skin that appears opaque and gray or white in color. So there are some costs of inaction not managing this population, one of those being we are at near the northernmost part of the hellbender's range meaning that if we allow this population to kind of blink out, it could isolate more northern populations up in New York. Um, we would also lose part of our native diversity. Hellbenders have been here for thousands of years. Losing any amount of biodiversity is always a loss um, for the ecosystem as a whole. And third, coming with that, isolating the northern populations and isolating our own Pennsylvanian populations we reduce the genetic flow between the different metapopulations, 
that can cause things like genetic drift, um, which re results in these hellbenders being less fit for survival within these systems. Let's go to the next slide. So our management plan is we want to locate suitable habitat if there is in Huntington County. Um, in Mac at all, they stipulate that hellbenders prefer cobble that is 12.5 centimeters to 20 centimeters across. More importantly, unembedded cobble. So cobble that isn't covered by silt and sediment, um, which is 13.1 times more likely to be used by hellbenders just because they can get underneath it and actually use it as cover. If we can't find any cobble like this, we can add additional cover uh, in the form of cement nesting huts. We'll talk a little bit more about the uh, actual schematic of that later. But these huts have been used in zoo environments to provide cover for hellbenders um, in breeding programs. And so we know they're successfully used. We'll release our hellbenders with pit tags, uh, not only to help us locate them later, but to mark them as part of our reintroduction population. Release them in groups of 100 over the course of several years, rather than a large group of, say, three or 400 in one big go. Um, it's been shown in other reintroductions that the slower release is more um, suitable to uh, conducive populations. And then we will collect eggs from the natural system in order to take them into captivity, raise them till they're about three or four years old, and then re-release them into the system. Um, with pit tags to mark them as our re reintroduced uh, individuals. It's been shown that reintroducing them at three to four years old is seven times more likely to survive to adulthood than if we were to just allow them to grow naturally within the system. Go to the next slide. So here's a little schematic of the nesting hut. Um, in the study Mac at all, they do a bunch of different sizes, and this was the most optimal size that the juvenile hellbenders seem to utilize the most. Go to the next slide. So in our post-monitoring plan, we'll focus on natural reproduction, dispersal, and behavior. Um, natural reproduction, we will go out, we'll survey the reintroduction area, and we will try and find hellbenders, juvenile and adult, that don't have pit tags. Because all the hellbenders that we release will be fitted with pit tags, any hellbender that doesn't have a pit tag can be assumed to be part of a naturally reproductive population. So growing naturally within the system without the aids of human, uh, human so that um, that just shows that the system is working. Uh, natural dispersal, as overcrowding takes place when the population grows, Hellbenders will disperse within the watershed. So we will survey nearby tributaries, see if they are showing more present of either our pit tag hellbenders or just naturally dispersing natural reproduction hellbenders. Um, so that will show population growth um, within the system and also natural behavior. If neither one or two um, is happening, maybe the population is growing slower than we thought it would. Uh, we can look to see that our reintroduced hellbenders are utilizing the nesting huts or utilizing natural cobble cover just to show that they're working well within the system and acting like hellbenders should. So stakeholders are a big piece of this plan. They will provide input on the best management management practices to use in addition to potentially supplying the necessary funding that can be used to develop, restore, or improve habitats that can put support the CDCs. The two distinct groups of stakeholders that will be consulted are state, federal agencies, along with people in the general public. Next. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service, and the PA Fish and Boat Commission are three state and federal agencies that can be part of this plan. When it comes to funding, all three of these agencies are funded in some manner. For example, the president has proposed a $2.1 billion budget to support the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, along with PA Fish and Boat being funded by license sales. Current slash future management efforts is to plan to ensue stakeholders will be brought in to help with research habitat creation and manpower. USDA and NRCS is currently making efforts to promote conservation practices that enhance habitat for hellbenders, addressing their recovery and more many more initiatives. Uh, the next set of stakeholders in our society revolve around private landowners, anglers, and the general public. 
Um, when it comes to access to land, we might run into areas where the only way to access certain sections of preferred aquatic environments is through private land. We must work with these private landowners to overcome this obstacle. Incentives, in some cases, different agencies and groups may look towards providing private landowners with incentives to allow us to work on their land. Most of the time, this is through means of money. Education, in our society, we all want to learn and get involved with different projects that benefit our lives as well as the environments around us. Through educational outreach programs with all three stakeholders, we can gather supporters. Funding, anyone who donates to the restoration of the hellbenders and or buys a fishing license would fund our plan and may ultimately be funding other conservation and management efforts. Support, by gathering different people within our society to support this plan, we can work towards improving the population numbers, bringing light to their importance, and ultimately benefiting the environment.